everyone. This is uh, Jessica Pora, Senior Manager for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. I'd like to welcome all of you to our collaborative webinar with X12 and CAQH Core on the 835 Transaction Standard and Operating Rules. Next slide. I'd like to mention a few logistical items. The slides are currently not on the website, but we will send them to you as well as the recording in the next day or so. Also, if you have questions, feel free, feel free to submit them at any time using the questions panel on the dashboard. As you can see, we've got two uh, great presentations chock full of information uh, that we will deliver to you shortly. The first presentation will be on the 835 transaction standard by a speaker from X12, and then we'll have a speaker from CORE talk about the EST and ERA operating rules. After that, we'll have uh, plenty of time to answer all of your questions. Next slide. I'd like to thank our speakers for being with us today. Um, and we will start with the next slide with our next presentation, which is on the 835 transaction standard. Uh, Pat, please feel free to begin when you're ready. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you all for joining today. I'm really glad to have this opportunity to provide a refresher for some of you or an introduction to the A35 for others. Uh, please, um, next slide, please. This is a informational uh, presentation. So, um, a little bit about X12 for those of you that may not know about the actual organization. Of course, you've all heard X12 related to the guides the implementation guides. Um, it was established um, as part of ANSI more than 35 years ago. We develop, establish, and maintain electronic, electronic data interchange, which is known as EDI standards. Uh, we write technical report threes, a TR3, uh, which is the same thing as an implementation guide that we're used to saying, as well as um, XML schemas, which drive the business processes globally. X12 membership includes providers, technologists, and business process experts across the industry, uh, which range from healthcare, insurance, transportation, finance, logistics, supply chain management, and many other industries. If you have any questions about X12 as an organization, you're welcome to visit the uh, web page at x12.org. Next slide. So, uh, a little bit about our agenda. We're going to talk about the purpose and scope of the 835. Um, why will we do the 835 versus paper remit device? What are the uses of the 835? Who uses the 835? How is it created and moved throughout the industry? How is an 835 gotten from that pay from that payer or other entity as far as enrollment? Uh, remittance device within the 835. Uh, a little bit about the enveloping, the structure, a very high-level structure of the 835. And then finally, what can you do? Next slide. So this is the purpose of uh, purpose and scope statement as it, as it is stated in the 835 transaction. So the purpose of the implementation guide is to provide standardized data requirements, and content for all users of the ASC X12 healthcare claim payment advice, which is known as the 835. The 835 contains information about future remittances, is one of is, is, is certainly one of its uses. Um, it is a it also provides a detailed explanation of the transaction set by defining data content, identifying valid code tables, and specifying values that are applicable for electronic claim payment. The intent of the developers of the 835 is represented in that guide. The implementation guide is designed to assist those who send and or receive the ERA, which is another name for an 835, and or payment. Next slide. So let's talk about 835 versus paper. Um, historically, across our industry, a paper remittance advice is published it contains all of the claim adjudication information. It's put in a nice, pretty envelope and mailed to the providers. Historically, uh, before there was something called EDI, um, you would have uh, folks sitting at a desk 
entering the data into the patient accounting system or whatever mechanism uh, to reflect the payment of the claim. Um, so EDI exchanges can automate the function of entering the data for payments, adjustments, denials into the receiver system. It eliminates moving paper, making copies, wonderful photocopies, manually posting of payments and adjustments. Um, there's an opportunity to improve the accuracy of the payment and adjustment posting uh, instead of you know, having the unfortunate uh, case where you would transpose, transpose numbers. That's, that's eliminated when you talk about an automated posting system. The 835 uses HIPAA mandated claim adjustment reason codes, which are called CARCs, and remittance advice remark codes, referred to as RARC, as compared to the old proprietary codes that payers uh, still to this day probably use internally um, and, and should in most cases not be published outside of their internal system. Uh, using the 835 offers a great opportunity to facilitate faster transaction processing as well as an opportunity to reduce the FTEs required to support remittance processing. I think that uh, that's probably the, the whole purpose of HIPAA, uh, you know, in adopting a VDI transaction. So let's talk about the uses of the 835. Um, uh, the 835 transaction reports adjudication results for finalized claims. I make that note because there has always been some confusion about pendant claims. Uh, pendant claims are not reported in the 835. Um, if there's information to be disseminated about a pendant claim, then that would be a totally different transaction, which is referred to as a 276 or 277. So the 835 will report payments adjustments, patient liability, provider adjustments. Provider adjustments are things that are not necessarily related to a claim. For example, interest. Um, other samples are things like forward balancing, and overpayment recovery, bonuses, or uh, uh, with the opposite of bonus, you know, some kind of a penalty. Um, it's used to reconcile denials, as well as uh, the effect of that is to resubmit corrected claims. So the sooner an A35 can be consumed into your accounting system, the sooner a, uh, the denials can be worked, and the sooner a corrected claim can be submitted to the payer for, uh, for some kind of um, additional reimbursement. Uh, so, uh, the A35 also facilitates claim payment. So as we've already said a couple times, that it provides the ability for auto posting. It also enables reassociation with the payment back to your bank account. So you receive the information, the trace number, which could be a check, could be an EFT number. It could be another identifiable trace number because possibly the total payment was a zero payment, um, but it still has its own unique trace number. So in the industry today, without going into too much detail, um, an EFT trace number um, the money is moving through the bank. There are some other banking transactions that would associate that EFT trace number so that here's my 835, my number. I go into my bank and I see the same number, dollar amounts match. Yay, everything's great and move on um, to the next step in your process. The 835 also um, is used for coordination of benefits and secondary payments. Um, if there, there's multiple facets to that, if the primary made a payment, payment information goes out, uh, claim is resubmitted to the secondary payer, and the secondary payer is now reporting um, the coordination of benefits. What, what, is that, what is that payment now that I am a secondary payer in respect to what the primary paid? So there's a whole lot of information that can be gathered um, in the A35 indicating that it's a secondary or higher uh, payment. And the other thing just to note here is that uh, the A35 is one of the transactions that's been adopted under HIPAA. Uh, I think there's, I'm not sure what the total number is today, seven or eight total transactions, and the A35 is one of them. So with that in mind, it is uh, the mandated transaction in the healthcare industry right now to report payment, uh, payment information. Next slide.
Okay, so who 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 will use the A35? Um, an organization sending the A35 would be your health plan or your payer. Um, it can be the state and federal agencies such as Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, also, what, what could come into play there is a third party administrator, if they're responsible for uh, working with the payer uh, to determine payment. Service corporations, uh, business process uh, entities who may be outsourced to create the A35 on behalf of the payer. All, those di all the different entities such as that would actually create, physically create an A35. We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. What's that process look like for creating an A35? Now there's also organizations receiving the A35. As you would expect, it would be your basic healthcare organizations, hospitals, nursing homes, laboratories, physicians, dentists, allied professionals. Um, also in there, uh, we need to include a vendor and a clearinghouse. Uh, we'll talk again in the next slide about what, what does that path look like. So at 835 is created, who, who as a payer, who would I hand that off to? Um, a clearinghouse, it could be a vendor. Um, all of those entities are part of the chain that uh, could be involved in handing off the 835, and it may be multiple jumps, as we'll also talk about. Next slide. Okay, so how is this 835 created? Um, payer has received claims from their provider base. They go through the process of adjudicating the claim. There's some kind of step involved where the claims are considered final. Uh, they've been signed off. You know, again, everyone has different processes. Um, at that point, uh, there would be some kind of programmatic uh, process in place where the 835 transaction would be created. Um, I would make a note here that that 835 must be HIPAA compliant when it's created before it's uh, sent out. Um, that means possibly the use of a validation tool. Uh, there are multiple across the industry. It also could mean that the payer or entity creating the 835 has chosen to build all of the rules in their uh, process so that that 835 is compliant. Um, but the key is that it, it really should not be handed off to the next entity if it is not compliant. Um, and there are multiple, uh, you know, SNP deals, the, the weedy SNP levels that a lot of people refer to across the industry. So there's different layers of validation that must be uh, accounted for. Typically, the A35 transaction, and we're going to talk about it as a large grouping at the moment, um, it, it, it's a series of payments for all of the providers that had claims paid on that particular date. Um, they're grouped together into a file, and then that file would be sent along to a receiver. The receiver, I would venture to say at this point in our industry, tends to be the clearinghouse. Um, they are the largest, uh, they, they, they're the organizations that, that tend to move the, the data, so they're the largest entities right now that that do that, um, but an A35 could be sent to a vendor or the provider themselves. So th there's multiple ways the 835 can move. Some of that depends upon the payer and their ability to distribute the 835. Uh, some of that depends upon other factors, um, re and I'm not gonna get into all that now, but, but it depends on their contracting. Let me just put it that way. If they've contracted with certain entities, for example, a clearinghouse. So once that 835 is sent out the door to a receiver, um, the next step is that that receiver must generate a 999 acknowledgement. Um, that is another transaction. Uh, it is created off of, of the process to read the 835. It reads it against the, the standard and it would report back any potential issues with the transaction. Um, if everything is fine, if, if it follows all the HIPAA standards, it, it, it's compliant, then that 999 acknowledgement would simply say we've accepted your file. And the last step is that the A35 is then consumed by the receiver system. Once it's in the hands of the vendor, the provider, again, multiple entities along the way could have this file. Um, it is then posted into the receiver system, hopefully in that automated fashion. Next slide, please. 
as I as we mentioned, the um, 835 is handed off from the payer organization to the next uh, party in line. Um, if it is a clearinghouse, uh, then a certain enroll, actually whether it's a clearinghouse or not, there has to be some enrollment that occurs for the provider to say, I want a copy of the 835. It has to come to me. Here's who I am. I'm a provider. I live in New Jersey. I um, you know, need it to come to me for all of these NPIs that are part of my organization. Or it could be tax IDs. There, there's multiple ways to enroll. A lot of that is dependent upon the payer or the clearinghouse or the other entity uh, who is requiring that information. In most cases, it's all of that data. Um, I wanted to note that there is a potential for multiple hops of this A35. So the provider may say to their vendor, I, I'm ready, I want the A35 because you provide me the ability to auto post it. So the provider then either enrolls themselves or the vendor could re enroll in their behalf. They may have to go to a clearinghouse, for example, that is uh, designated for that vendor. Then that clearinghouse may then have to make a jump and go to another clearinghouse that is the payer's clearinghouse, for example. So there could be multiple layers of enrollment along the way. This is one of the uh, points of failure uh, when you talk about the 835. It's generated by the payer, it's HIPAA compliant, everything's wonderful, it goes out the door, and then the provider's sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and they never receive their 835. And it very possibly is due to this enrollment. It's just not getting connected all the way through the process. Um, CAQH Core has uh, two related operating rules that are directly related to this enrollment information. It's uh, Core Rule 380, which is for EFT enrollment, and Rule 382, which is for the ERA enrollment. Um, we are not really talking too much today about EFT, but it is much the same process that happens in the healthcare industry. The EFT uh, could be a different NACHA transaction, which is the banking industry transaction, or it could look nothing more than a, an 835 that's designated as an EFT file. Um, but the operating rules uh, are directly related to this enrollment process. Next slide, please. So the remains of vice within an 835. So what do we mean by that? Again, let's go back and picture a payer has generated their 835 for today. They have a production. Today's my payday. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay today. So for every provider that has claims that were finalized, a payment will be generated. $100 to provider A for three claims and $10,000 to provider B for 100 claims and you know $400 to provider C. All, all of that comes out of their payment cycle. Each of those payments individually is considered an 835 transaction set. And I'll show you the concept of a transaction set in a moment. So each transaction set has a begin and end to it. It has a total payment amount, it identifies the provider, and then it lists all the claims and all the claim payment detail. Each of those represents, as I'm saying, one check or one EFT payment, so the method of payment. It could be uh, that there's no payment, even though I have five claims, all those claims were denied and not pay, and paid zero. Um, I'd still have a transaction set. It would still have a individual trace number, and it would have a total payment of zero. So each one of those is a transaction set. Mul and of course, as I've mentioned, multiple claims can be reported within that 835. And in most cases, it is many, many claims, more than one. So then we take all of those individual transaction sets for that day. Each has a begin and end to it, as far as the 835 transaction. And then we put them all together in one physical file. That physical file is then the part that is transmitted to that next entity, whether it be that clearinghouse or vendor. If the payer offers different um, doors into them, so they allow providers to get them directly, they allow vendors, they allow clearinghouses, then they could potentially create different, three different files 
for each of those entities, for example, and then they're uh, ultimately uh, transmitted. Next slide. So th this is a picture, hopefully, of what I was trying to describe. So over under the ST, there, these are the segments within the A35. We're not really getting into that deep dive today. That would be a, the next future session where we start talking about segments and elements and the looping structure. But we would have one payment right here. It would be start has a begin, has an end. It lists all the details about the transaction, and then it lists all the individual claims. And remember that a claim has service lines. So again, within each of those claim payment details, you're going to have a total, total claim amount, total claim paid amount, who, who's my member, all of that wonderful information. And then it'll start listing all the service lines. Service line one, I paid $5. Service line two, got $10, et cetera. All right, so multiple claims within that, within that, this is a transaction set. And then the next one, this would be that provider B, same thing of individual claims with their uh, detailed service lines. Once we've gathered that all together, uh, the next, there is a, there's an outer start and end of a group. Um, again, this could, there's many, many ways that these groups could be defined. Um, it also could just be a single group in that 835 file. And then the outermost um, grouping is, is the start and end of the actual transaction or that physical file, as I mentioned earlier. So you would have an interchange envelope around it. So think of these as I'm sending uh, presents to my cousins who have two or three kids. Each inner, inner box here is a present. Um, and then I put them together because they're going to my cousins in Portland, Oregon. And then I put them in a giant box that has the mailing address on it. So this would be sort of representing the mailing address. Next slide. Okay. So this was our introduction. I, I hope that it is helping um, understand the big picture about the 835. Um, if you, anyone is interested in becoming a member of X12, um, we are more, I mean, always open to, to members. We have a lot of payers, providers, clearinghouses, everyone, multiple entities across the industry are part of X12. Um, we have standing meetings, uh, physical meetings um, that we meet three times a year, and we try to alternate across the country, East Coast, Central, West Coast. The next meeting is in January in Portland, Oregon. Um, we, uh, we do the prior to the publication. So a lot of the work that we do is we build the next version. And we are doing that right now. I'm sure many of you have heard the buzz that we're going to have a new version 7030 or something very soon. Uh, we are in the final stages of uh, building that next version. We review the draft implementation. Uh, we we actually sit as groups, as individual groups for each transaction, and we decide and, and help build the rules and, and, and address the business needs. So you also have an um, opportunity to submit a request. So if your organization has a need for the next version for a specific guide for a specific need, um, the, the, the fun example is always shoe size. You know, if there's some reason you need to collect shoe size on your claim, and it's not there now. There is a, um, a mechanism for you to be able to request that change without being part of X12. Um, and so the, if you were on the X12 website, there's a lot of information there that you would be able to uh, follow to, 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 to make that request. All right. And I think with that, I am done. Um, questions and feedbacks are welcome. Again, visit the website. and. I think I will now hand this back to Bob. Great, thank you, Pat. Thanks, thank you for the wonderful overview of what exactly X12 is working on for the 835 and what the 835 really is for us. Um, what I would like to do now is go into the second part of our agenda and talk about the operating rules that the core participants built around the standard, the standard 835 that Pat went, just went through. Um, but first, a little bit background about who CAQH Core and what our participants are. We are a mission and vision 
driven organization that really is a coalition of different segments of the industry. So we bring together providers, health plans, vendors, government entities, associations, um, standard setting organizations like X12. Um, we all come together and we talk about some of the issues that um, adoption has had, uh, either with the provider community or with the health plan community, um, what we can do to help support vendors implement solutions that support both of those constituencies. And we come together with that mission and vision of setting and developing um, operating roles that kind of bring together standards and interoperability and as administrative and clinical activities continue to merge together along with the data needs and data sharing needs of the entire industry, what can we do as that facilitator um, of the industry? So again, we all sit around a round table, everyone gets one vote, and we develop operating roles. Um, we have been designated by HHS to develop operating roles for any HIPAA mandated transaction. And we'll see in just a moment that, that we've done that for all of them uh, and where uh, the phase three sits for the EFT and ERA, we'll see exactly what that means in just a moment. But again, we do try to ensure that as we build operating roles, we're trying to build a more efficient, really national system of interoperability between the data needs of providers and health plans, and what infrastructure and what those data needs are based on very specific standards. Um, it's really important to know also that our core board is multi-stakeholder. We do have health plans and providers sitting together to help drive the work that we do on an annual basis. So they help us make decisions on where we need to work next. Again, these are both health plans and providers, along with advisors to the board that includes X12, HL7, NACHA. We heard this earlier with related to the um, the payment, the EFT transaction, the NCPDP as well as WEDI, they're all part of our organization to help drive our goals for each year. If we can go to, go to the next slide, you'll see that we do have um, sets of operating roles for each of the main interactions that a provider and health plan have with each other, from verifying eligibility, checking the status of a claim, submitting a claim, um, uh, getting authorization for a service. And the focus for today is the ERA. How can a provider receive information about the claims that they submitted previously? And what is that record that comes back and letting them know the adjudication results of those claims? So we do have operating roles for each one of these kinds of interactions. And they're really important because you have to be able to interact, conduct the standard transaction to have that interaction, and you have to be able to receive that data in a, in a way that is most conducive to actually being able to function as a provider, right? They have to be able to see patients, verify eligibility, submit claims, receive payment, and be able to understand what those payments really are. Um, we have the same type of operating rules that you find in other segments of different industries, like in finance for banking. Anyone can walk into any, up to any ATM uh, machine in the world, and because there are very specific NACHA operating rules, you can key in your um, PIN number and receive funds at that ATM no matter where you're at, even though you may bank at a very local small credit union in your own uh, own town, right? Um, because it is a national, actually for finances, an international approach for operating roles. We take that same approach here at CAQH Core in developing a national set of operating roles so the transactions can be conducted um, uniformly. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that as we move into the more specifics around the EFT and ERA operating roles, um, Pat mentioned we do have some operating roles related to EFT and ERA enrollment data roles. We also have some roles around EFT and ERA reassociation. And we also have roles around infrastructure, right? We really have to lay the tracks down for the train, the transaction to go forward and backward between the health plan and the provider right, for the 835 transaction. So there is very specific companion guide templates that's used. There are requirements around connectivity. How does the provider in, go and pick up the 835 or how is it submitted or transmitted to the provider or the provider's clearinghouse? Um, there's also requirements around acknowledgements. Once the 835 is received by the provider, the health plan can receive an acknowledgement check. Yes, we've sent that and the provider has received it. We don't have to maybe host this for as long as we do. Maybe we only host it for 30 days or 60 or 90. And we can kind of age those off for the next batch to come on, right? There's different ways and different business processes that can be facilitated with the operating roles. Um, last but not least, there's also very specific rules around data content. Um, for phase three, for the EFT and ERA rule set, we have a uniform use of the CARCs and RARCs, and these are very specific um, 
messaging back to the provider that's found within the 835 transaction to ensure that the provider knows exactly how each individual uh, claim or claim line was adjudicated by the health plan. So if there was um, co-insurance, a co-pay, um, a, a contractual write-off for the amount, um, whatever those very nuanced, very specific payment adjudication requirements are from each individual health plan, they, they encode that data, how they do that to the provider so the provider knows exactly how that happened. And we have a rule in phase three related to those CARCs and RUGs, those adjustment codes or reason codes, and what that means for the providers. So the provider can actually post these transactions to their AR, to the member AR, so the, so the member can actually understand that too, right? So there's a way of doing this very systematically and automatically, so the providers don't have to manually key in all of this data, right? One of the reasons of going to the 835. If we go to the next slide, there's going to be some um, additional key benefits related to the adoption of the 835. So if you're a provider on the call today, on the webinar today, and you haven't migrated completely to the 835 just yet, you're still having some hesitancy, there are some key benefits in going to a fully automated 835 transaction, right? It can improve cash flow because it expedites the payment and the remittance advice reconciliation. You're not having to key in all of that information from every paper remittance advice that you're probably going to a web portal to download, or heaven forbid, if you're actually receiving paper remittance advice transact uh, in the mail today and you're working those manually, right? This all becomes electronically into your practice management system, into your finance system, into your AR system, um, and can auto post. Um, it eliminates the need for all that manual keying. Um, it does increase the ability to conduct targeted payment issues and follow-ups, right? Because you can easily see which ones fall out more quickly and work those that fall out where you have to have questions. Either you um, can make that phone call to the health plan or you can go to the website or the web portal that the health plan um, has made available to resolve any sort of um, those one-offs that are you don't understand the reason for the, the payment denial or for the payment adjustment and you need that extra help. It helps you identify them much more quickly. It also standardizes the enrollment for the EFT and ERA transaction. As Pat said, we do have an enrollment data set that does require health plans to support electronic enrollment. So providers can more easily, more rapidly adopt the transactions because everything's electronic. Um, we also help automate the reassociation of the EFT and ERA. The banks can provide a reassociation file or key, basically, to ensure that, as Pat mentioned, there's a, a number between both the EFT and the ERA, and that number, as well as the date and the amounts, um, can help you um, match those two together because they come from two different sources, one from your financial institution and then one from your health plan or any intermediaries that are in between the two. Again, it has been estimated that hundreds of millions of dollars can potentially be saved by the healthcare system with adopting uh, these two specific transactions, just the 835 and the EFT transaction, that payment transaction, right? Lots of paper checks are being mailed today from health plans to providers, and providers are signing those and running those to the bank, right? We would never want to actually have to do that for our own paychecks, but health plans provide, uh, pay providers that very manual process by the billions of dollars worth of transactions today. So any uptick we can make in adopting electronic transactions can really help the industry. If we move to slide 24, uh, on the next slide, um, you'll see that there is, uh, as I mentioned, there's this bifurcated process between these two transactions, right? Uh, the provider submits the claim, but the ERA transaction, the 835, comes from the health plan. But the health plan then sends the EFT payment information to the bank, and then it goes to the provider's bank. So there's um, some complexity for the enrollment for both the EFT and the ERA transaction. And so we do have some um, guidance that we've provided for the industry. We have a couple of tools and resources available. Um, some of that is related to um, the analysis and planning guide. If you are using vendors in your front door or your back door for um, how you're conducting the transactions or how you may wish to conduct the transaction, we have um, basically analysis and planning guide you can share with your vendor to make sure that they're in conformance and compliance with the operating rules and the standard to make sure you get all the data that you need, right? So you have to have that data to really facilitate that conversation. 
We also have the, some sample letters for EFT request letter. So if you wish to request an EFT from a health plan, you can simply use this form letter and make sure it has all the information and all the keywords that a health plan needs to understand from you, the provider, uh, to understand that, that you want to enroll for this. Um, we also have a sample letter for the reassociation data request that you would share with your financial institution. So again, it has all the key terms, the, the exact phrases, and the exact enumeration of things, so providers don't have to guess about it. You can share this very easily with your financial institution, and they will understand exactly what you're requesting from them. Um, again, we also do have a course certification program, so any vendors or health plans, and many, many health plans are phase three certified now, many of the national plans that you can think of, and many, many of the state-based plans, many of the blues plans, are also there for phase three too. So that means that they're actually in conformance and in compliance with delivering the data in the format that you need with the 835 transaction, and they're also delivering it to you with the infrastructure requirements that are required under the operating rules. So that core certified list is available for free on our website. And if your vendor is not core certified, we, again, we have tools and resources to help them plan for that certification, and all of that is um, free. We support that process uh, for those vendors free. There's, a, there's a, a fee to get the seal, but to go through the testing and that conformance and compliance testing, that is all free. So that's a great resource for the vendors and clearinghouses out there to ensure that they're doing the right thing by their clients. If we go to the next slide, we do have a couple of slides related specifically to some of the requirements related to maintenance. Um, because we have a CARC and a RARC rule around very specific business scenarios, so there's four core business scenarios. Again, we took the 80-20 approach. I, again, when I say we, it's the core participants identified the four main reasons why a claim line or a claim would be adjusted um, or changed or denied because from the initial submission of the claim to how the remittance advice would come out the door. And so we're looking at these key business scenarios, we group together a specific CARC, a specific RARC, a group code. Again, it's the claim adjustment reason code, the remittance advice remark code, and the claim adjustment group code. With those three pieces of data, you can identify exactly why that claim was adjusted or denied. So make it very easy for the provider then to understand that if we have to rebuild or go to a, a secondary payer because of maybe a COB scenario, um, or you know to uh, this is the, the end of the bill, you, you've got full payment, um, or you have to uh, balance bill the patient for this particular component because maybe you collected uh, $50 for um, the copay and it was actually a $100 copay, so the $50 outstanding that you can still collect. There's all these different scenarios that are present within the CARC, RARC, and group codes. Those three pieces of data combined together can really inform the provider exactly what to do and in, to remediate any billing issues. Um, on the next slide, um, we also have a enrollment data set maintenance process, and that process includes that because we have different data sets, one data set for EFT enrollment and one data set for ERA enrollment, that we have to ensure that um, that data set stays current with business need. So on an annual basis, we go through a maintenance process and we ask the industry to submit any adjustments that they would like to have to either of those data sets. I mean, it may be uh, non-substantive edits, maybe some of the wording that we use in the language of the data set needs to be adjusted, or perhaps it, the industry is really looking for um, new, new pieces of data. Maybe there's something different that we have to do or collect from a provider to better understand their, their banking setup. Uh, or how they want to have their banking set up, right? All of those different processes, uh, we allow for that maintenance to take place on an annual basis. Um, so again, we'll be launching this process uh, actually later this month for the enrollment data sets. So, uh, so I'm glad you're on the call. Do you have a chance to weigh in if, if you need any adjustments for this particular data set as well? Um, if we can go to the next slide, we actually will run into um, a, a great kind of overview of uh, the data set and maintenance process. I'm, I'm sorry, um, we'll have our first polling question. Um, what we would like to do is, be, is to better understand where the participants on this call would like to see next um, in the next couple of polling questions. The first is, what is the level of the industry awareness of and compliance of, of the EFT and ERA data enrollment set requirements? Or you have low, 
limited, moderate, high, or very high awareness and or compliance for the enrollment data set requirements. Again, with this being a hot topic for us for the rest of the year and into January, we want to make sure that we can address any industry needs. We'll give us just a few more minutes to stay open and we'll share the results with you. Hey Jessica, I think we can go ahead and close this and share the results. Great. It's great to see well over a majority of moderate to high to very high awareness. Um, so again, uh, with about 30% reporting limited to low, uh, again, hopefully with this education session and our continued um, correspondence that you'll have from us for the rest of the year, if you're interested in understanding more about the enrollment data set, the maintenance process, we'll make sure we uh, keep you up to date with our work that we do for the, right, for the next three months. Um, one thing that we also find is that's really important um, and helps provide context uh, of where we're at with the adoption process or cycle is that um, you can see that the 2018 CAQH index report, which is basically a report of how the industry is moving from uh, through the adoption cycle, um, for each of the standard transactions. Here you see that for claims uh, for the last four years, from 2015 to 2018, we've gone from 94 to 96% of all claims are submitted electronically. So basically you're coming in on an 837 format. So it makes it very easy for health plans to adjudicate those claims and process remittance advice in an EFT transaction. However, we have a very high rate of electronic claim submission. We have a much lower rate for EFT payment, which is currently at 63% for 2018. And the remittance advice payment, and the remittance advice is down to about 50%. If you were to normalize those numbers, it's about right about 50%. So nearly 100% of claims come in electronically, but only 50% of those claims are represented on an 835 transaction. So there's a big drop for, for providers. Um, in, in supporting the EFT transaction as well as the 835 transaction. All the providers are submitting electronic claims, but they're consuming paper remittance advice transactions or a PDF, or they're receiving a paper check. So part of our advocacy, both at X12 as, as well as CAQH Core, is to advocate for provider adoption, as well as for vendors to fill those voids and help if providers need that type of support. Right, we understand that there's definitely challenges with 835 adoption from health plans. We're working with those with that constituency as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, there will be our last polling question, and then we'll jump into our uh, Q&A portion of the of the webinar. But what topic would you be more interested in in the next webinar series? Um, select all that apply from a deep dive on the 835 to intro to the 278, a deep dive on the 278 or intro or deep dive on the 837. Again, we're trying to ensure that our partnership with X12 carries through through 2020, and we wanna make sure that part of that uh, partnership includes um, a webinar series for the industry for both the adoption of the electronic transactions and their associated operating rules. Give you just oh, Bob, let me just add. Oh, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Uh, I just wanted to add that we um, have planned um, for additional 835 sessions to do that deeper dive. Um, this would help us understand the, the, the group that is most interested so that we could potentially uh, tailor that session, is it, whether it be providers, payers, clearinghouses, vendors. Um, so, so the responses here will actually help us uh, in that respect. Yep, great, great. So we'll let this open. Um, Jessica, you can probably go ahead and show the results. And again, will help us get, provide us feedback on how we want to continue forward. Um, great, it's, it's a great um, high interest in the 835 transaction, just as we anticipated. Um, and, and with that, I'll hand the call over to Jessica for moderating our Q&A. Thanks so much, Bob and Pat. Really appreciated those presentations. Now we have uh, time for Q&A. We've received quite a few questions, so I will try my best to kind of put them in buckets. Um, so the first question we received um, is, if a health plan is not um, delivering an ERA transaction electronically, um, what can a provider do to sort of remediate or, or 
or try to find a fix to that. Uh, I'm going to send this one over to you, Pat. Okay. Uh, so if I understand right, the payer is not currently today offering an A35. Is, is that the question? Yep. Okay. Um, and the well, under HIPAA, it. and the providers requesting it, right? So under HIPAA, the original rule stated that um, a payer must provide um, and and uh, the transaction sets if a provider requests it. So today, if that's not happening and you have tried multiple times, uh, the the next step would probably be to to reach out to CMS. There there is a place where you can file, and I'll call it a complaint, um, but it's really probably not so much a complaint as I need help. Um, and then CMS uh, has a process where they would uh, reach out and try to work with those payers. Uh, thank you so much. And um, you touched upon this, but I think this is kind of a point of confusion sometimes in the industry, but if a provider requests um, a HIPAA covered transaction from a plan, is a plan required to conduct the, that transaction electronically? Yes, they are. And again, it was under the HIPAA, uh, original HIPAA uh, rule that stated that. Um, and, and, you know, payers have multiple ways that they could do that. They could partner with another entity. Um, I know that there are entities that do hosting solutions, say, for example, a 270, 271 transaction for eligibility. Um, so. So depending on the upon the transaction that's being requested, you know the payers payers have some opportunity and option to help get that transaction running, but they are absolutely obligated to provide it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, another question that came in was um, another one for you, Pat. Uh, how does the A35 relate to the uh, 276 and 277? I think you had mentioned it in the beginning of your presentation. Yes, yeah, so the A35 reports finalized claims, meaning that they have gone through the adjudication process and a determination of payment has been made. Um, if a claim has not finished and, and become final, it's considered pended. So the way to transmit information about pending claims is that 276 slash 277. Provider could send a request, which is the 276, and say, hey, could you tell me about this claim and what's going on? The 277 is the response. Um, there is an opportunity for payers to distribute um, a claim status uh, transaction, which would be the 277, um, that would give potentially a list of, say, all pended claims in their system as of today, uh, which would also help the provider. So pay payers have a couple of different options there. Um, but they, but pended claims are not reported in the A35. Thank you, Pat. Um, Bob, we received uh, quite a few questions about that index slide that you talked about a few minutes ago. I think a lot of people were sort of noting um, that the ERA transaction number had kind of bumped down between uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, is that sort of a collection thing, or, or is there a reason for that dip? Yeah, it, it's not really a, a super substantive dip. Part of it is a data collection, um, because it's the, the collection is extrapolation from all of the submissions that we have, from all of the health plans that uh, submit data, as well as vendors and clearinghouses and health and, and the providers. So some of it is, I think, a little bit of that kind of radiation from one health plan submitted last year, another one didn't submit this year, so that other health plan has lower rates of adoption in the industry. And also part of it is some providers are, um, some health plans and providers are using other means for receiving that payment or for the remittance advice transaction. Um, providers might be jumping onto health plan portals, providers might be uh, receiving uh, credit card payments. Uh, so some of those dips and little variations are, Part of it is reporting, and part of it is there are other mechanisms that our providers are using uh, to obtain the data. Again, we look at the index looks at um, a fully automated uh, HIPAA-based transaction um, allows for full automation. If you use something other than that, a partially electronic transaction like downloading a PDF of an ERA transaction from a provider portal 
for receiving a, a, um, a, a credit card payment. These are, there's a manual step in that process for the provider, right? They have to key into a provider portal. They have to download a PDF. They have to upload that information into the provider portal. The PDF is electronic, right? It's coming from an electronic source, uh, but it's a very manual kind of based transaction too, right? Or interaction that the provider has with the health plan data. So the index, and I'll, I would recommend everyone go check out the index, and we'll have a new one coming out soon for the 2018 data um, in January. So as we continue to track and trend the adoption of each of these transactions, and, and again, we just included claims, remits, and EFT transactions on this, but the index includes everything, both remittance advice, um, prior authorizations, it has the whole host of the transactions, including acknowledgements even. So there's lots of data available there, um, and it's a great tool for us to track and trend adoption rates of providers for not just fully electronic transactions, but every other means that a provider has in interacting with the health plan. Uh, thank you, Bob. And that uh, index should be coming out early next year, so uh, definitely look for that information. Um, so, Pat, uh, we received sort of the, the the opposite of the question I had asked you uh, earlier. So, if a payer wants to exclusively use the 835, can they force their providers to use, to use it? So they generate an A35 and don't provide any other mechanism to disseminate the payment information. Um, that's an interesting question. I'm not, um, but yes, they could. Um, but what that would mean is the providers would have to accept the A35 or find, as Bob was referring to, potentially another mechanism for accessing that data, whether it be a portal um, or you know a, a way to print it as a PDF, for example. Um, that's what it's forcing the provider base to do. Um, there, there, there could be a lot of pushback if that were the case. Um, not all providers have some of those other mechanisms, um, you know, uh, available to them. So it, it could cause some provider angst if that were the case. But that's not a HIPAA Thanks. rule. I, I will mention that that's not written that way in the rules, the way it is that if a provider wants the transaction, they have to get it. So it's not really, there's nothing written that, that forces a payer to only uh, offer it. That's really helpful. Thank you, Pat. Um, so I think uh, we got several questions about sort of, um, you know, asking what an EDI clearinghouse was. And I think, you know, that sort of serves the purpose of this webinar, which is to provide a kind of an introductory um, webinar on this transaction. Uh, this question could go to either of you. Can you give an example of what an EDI clearinghouse is? Uh, this is Pat. So an EDI clearinghouse to me would be, um, you know, an entity, a clearinghouse, they receive claims, uh, 837 claims from a provider. They take those claims and pass them on to all of the respective payers. Um, they could possibly uh, take a paper claim um, and turn it into an 837. There, there are services that do that. And then again, distribute the 837. They would then take the 835 from the payers and do the same reverse distribution back to the provider base. Um, they would uh, take a 270 eligibility inquiry in, send it to the payer, get the response back, and then you know return the response. So, I mean, to me, that's what an EDI clearinghouse is. They are moving these EDI transactions in and out and, um, you know, getting them from providers, payers, and then back again. Um, I don't know if you have a different... Uh, no, no, I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's a perfect definition of what, of what a clearinghouse is. Um, for actual entities that do that, we, we do have a list of entities on our website that are course certified. You can see their certification levels at phases one through five. Um, and for EFT and ERA, that's a phase three certification. Um, there are many, many um, vendors that work and partner with both providers and health plans to provide those types of services. 
Um, and, and so if you are a provider and are looking for a vendor that can provide those services to help automate, move you into the automation game, uh, feel free to use our website, use other resources. I don't want to just harp on, on core certified entity, but if you, that a core certified entity has gone through um, the rigorous process of obtaining certification, they've gone through the testing, they've gone through uh, lots of effort um, to submit transactions to a testing site. The testing site looks at the transactions and confirms that they're in conformance both with the X12 TR3 guidelines, so that's HIPAA conformance and compliance, as well as conformance and compliance with the phase three operating rules. So those vendors are um, are ones that have gone through that extra step to making sure that they can deliver those benefits to the providers that use them. Uh, that's very helpful. Thanks, both of you. Um, so one question here is uh, on acknowledgement. Uh, is a payer required to receive a successful 999 from the receiver in order to be compliant? Uh, I, this is Pat. I'm I'm trying to think if if it's a. I mean, the 999 is part of the HIPAA suite, I believe. Um, I think that that comes into play with trading partner agreements. It is probably the better answer. Um, if a payer has set up a, a relationship and they are sending, for example, a clearinghouse. Um, that trading partner agreement talks about the uh, receipt of a 999 or the expectation of a 999. Um, it's pretty much industry standard, though, to be able to acknowledge transactions, but it's, I don't know that it's fully mandated. Um, Bob, is there anything that you're aware of that? Um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would jump in. Yeah, exactly, Pat. I think that um, for the use of the acknowledgments, they are part of X12. X12 develops them. Um, they are maintained by X12. The operating rules that are in place for phases one through three do require the use of acknowledgement. So as mentioned, any of those core certified entities, that includes health plans, vendors, clearinghouses, and many providers as well, um, that are certified, they're conducting or have the ability to conduct the acknowledgement transactions as well. So again, often we see this as a claim comes in from a provider to a health plan, the health plan acknowledges receipt of it. So the provider understands that a, it's been received by the health plan, it can be adjudicated by the health plan, they should receive something right. with remittance advice and a payment for that claim within a typical billing cycle, hopefully a week, could be 30 days, right? We also have a requirement for the 999 for the 835, so that when a health plan delivers an 835 or a health provider picks up the 835, the provider, or in many cases, the provider's clearinghouse or vendor can generate that 835 back to the health plan, notifying that it's been picked up, it's been received, it's good to go. Um, and that okay. just is the roles and responsibilities of trading partners, kind of as Pat mentioned, there's trading partner agreements out there between each of these entities, and what are the expectations? So the core rules require the ability to send and receive acknowledgements, and you'll be certified on the ability to do that. Um, but it will be up to the individual trading partners if you wish to receive those acknowledgements. They're not HIPAA mandated or HIPAA required, but it's best business practice. It is best practice. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Best practice. Yeah. A lot of audits, I, I'll, I'll add that, a lot of audits um, I've seen recently are coming back looking for the 999 acknowledgement to verify that, you know, very, the transactions were accepted. I'm very seeing that good more point. and more um, now. Yep, and we're seeing that even with a lot of SOX 2 audits, a lot of different yeah. types of audits that you wouldn't, and, and, yeah. you know, five years ago you wouldn't have thought that a 999 acknowledgement would have been, um, that importance, but now many, many uh, vendors and clearinghouses and health plans are really realizing the, the benefits for acknowledging receipt of a transaction um, or denying it, right? Because there are denials. A negative 99 can be a rejection as well. Um, and what that means for um, receipt dates, what that means for um, different penalties that states have for clean claims and audits, both at the national level as well as different industry level. And with that, um, I think we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I know that there were a few more questions that came in that were really specific um, to the speaker. Um, I encourage you to submit those questions uh, to our inbox and we will try to help you. Um, 
thank you so much for joining the, the first in, in our series with X12 and CH2H Core. Uh, we will send you the slides and recording in the next day or so, and we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks.